I think we are live, Adria. Um, so Great. checking the other side, so we should be good. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is the Bariatric Friday. So we are here. Uh, my name is uh, Kamal Erkin. I'm the chairman of American Surgery Center. And I have Dr. Aizaz Irgal with me, and he's our program director. Uh, and I'm going to ask him to introduce himself as usual. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, it's very nice to be back on uh, Bariatric Friday. My name is Dr. Irgal. I am a bariatric surgeon, a weight loss surgeon. Uh, that's my main specialty. I have been uh, performing weight loss surgery, uh, bariatric surgery now for 20 years. And with my associates at CREAS, we are by far the most experienced group when it comes to weight loss surgery or bariatric surgery in our area. Thank you, Dr. Now, so today, actually, uh, I'm gonna um, actually do a little shortcut on the introduction uh, part, but uh, if you can actually just uh, remind us the qualifications for um, bariatric surgery and uh, who's qualified and what conditions they need to, what qualification they need to have. Absolutely. So weight loss surgery or bariatric surgery currently is the most effective treatment we have for um, morbid obesity or obesity that has gone really to an extreme level that it threatens the health of the person. So to qualify for bariatric surgery, a person's weight has to be at least 100 pounds over the ideal body weight for that particular person. Another way to look at this is to look at the BMI or body mass index, which is a number that is um, derived by putting together the height and the weight of the person. So a normal body mass index would, would be a, between 18 and 25. And morbid obesity is defined with a body mass index greater than 40. So for a person to qualify for bariatric surgery, their body mass index or their BMI has to be 40 or greater. Although there is an exception to that. And that is if a person has a BMI between 35 and 40, mm -hmm. but they've already developed severe illnesses related to obesity, like type two diabetes, sleep apnea or high blood pressure, they could also qualify for bariatric surgery. So Dr. Gal, um, before, uh, I mean, we are gonna, have, our main topic today is, uh, patients may have questions uh, in terms of what could go wrong. Uh, but before we get to this, this qualification, as I was asking the question of what are the qualifications, is one of those things that actually bothers me, um, which is, I, I believe for uh, New Year, when we start our uh, new um, round on these events, one of the things that I want to, um, I want us to emphasize more and more is, uh, you know, in business, we have the root cause analysis. So what is the issue, where the issue is coming from, rather than just troubleshooting the uh, outcome, the problems, then you do need to actually uh, go to the root of the problem. And uh, it's one of those um, big problems that I see in medicine is uh, as uh, obesity did, was not even recognized as a chronic disease until 2010. Yeah. And then now you have to qualify to get uh, uh, the surgery. Now you have to be you know, big enough or heavy enough, or you have to have multiple diseases to get the surgery. It's almost like making it, if, uh, if, if this is some crazy thing to have. And I think what we need to really focus on is uh, obesity is the root of many of the other chronic problems. Can you actually speak to that, uh, speak on absolutely. that? Absolutely, absolutely, come on. That's actually a great point. So. From uh, our point of view, obesity is not only an issue of uh, uh, inconvenience, appearance, which definitely it is as well. But more importantly, as you correctly said, obesity actually is the source of many illnesses that occur in our society, whether it's type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, high cholesterol, heartburn, uh, fatty liver, many types of cancers, uh, venous insufficiency, joint problems, back problems, headaches, many psychological problems. They are all actually related to obesity. And we have shown through multiple studies that when you take care of obesity through so effective treatments like bariatric surgery, mm -hmm. you're actually liberating the person from all these illnesses as well. 
you also correctly Kumar, say that it's even the medical community has been very slow to recognize this fundamental problem, right? It's only been recently that the AMA also recognized obesity as a disease. Mm -hmm. Now that this has become common knowledge among all medical practitioners, we see primary care doctors who used to struggle taking care of each of these illnesses in a single person separately, right? Medication for diabetes, medication for high blood pressure, CPAP for sleep apnea, uh, treatment for swollen legs, treatment for other ailments. When they're all related to obesity, now they realized it and we're seeing more and more family doctors actually encouraging their patients to look into bariatric surgery as a very important form of uh, treatment for uh, morbid obesity. So, um, the, uh, as you know, um, as you're part of the, uh, not only just part of the um, ACO Economic Care Organization, but you are the vice, uh, vice chair of that organization, uh, we have uh, daily case conferences, which we started after the success that we see from our bariatric program. So we do the same thing for um, chronically ill patients. Uh, the issue that I see is the disconnect between uh, sometimes with our bariatric program and the uh, ACO. Now, not between the two programs, but the two different worlds of the medicine, while we are trying to actually get the patients uh, go through several different processes. On the other side, we identify patients with diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, the heart uh, disease, um, uh, sleep apnea, all these problems. And then the only thing that's not diagnosed is the root of all those problems. And I'm like, well, uh, there is something missing here. Yeah. But not only we are missing it, but the medical directors of these insurance companies are missing it. Sure. And, uh, you know, um, I don't have to be politically correct, but some of those guys are not even practicing medicine mm -hmm. and they don't really understand uh, the actual clinical issue. Um, at least I know where my place is when it comes to the clinical. So I asked the uh, clinician who's practicing, practicing actively. But uh, even the, the, the approach from the uh, insurance uh, medical directors, well, well, patient doesn't have enough, they don't have enough qualifications. Qualify for what, right? So the root of the problem not even being diagnosed is a huge problem. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So if you are a morbidly obese patient currently in our society, it's actually very difficult to get bariatric surgery. You have to go through so many hurdles, as you correctly say, you have to qualify, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at this, when we look at morbid obesity as such a major, major uh, uh, illness and also such an, you know, widespread problem in our society, we should be encouraging patients and we should be making it easier for patients to understand and seek bariatric surgery. As it is, it's not. So as you correctly said, People are treating bariatric surgery as if people are lined up to have surgery. Nobody wants to have surgery. No one. No one wants to have surgery. But when people realize that that is an important treatment for this life-threatening condition they have, then they come to terms with the idea and they say, my doctor has recommended it. I do need to look into this. When people are doing that, you, we should be encouraging them rather than putting obstacles in front of them. I mean, not too long ago, you and I have come across a situation where there was a patient with a body mass index greater than 40 entering our program, right? That mm -hmm. patient absolutely needs and qualifies for bariatric surgery according to our current criteria, right? Yeah. That patient enrolled in our program to go through multidisciplinary evaluation. And guess what? They are learning and they are adapting the learned uh, uh, practices and they are losing weight, not enough for them to get out of morbid obesity, but for their body mass index to decrease maybe by one, two, three units. Guess yeah. what? The insurance company actually uh, penalized them for that. They say, because you've lost 10 pounds through the process, you no longer qualify. Yeah, like I call the word punitive. So they are being punitive. Punitive, for punitive. So this should not happen. We should be encouraging people seeking treatment, legitimate treatment to get it. We shouldn't be assuming as if there are people lining up to have bariatric surgery and we're saying, okay, only this many can have it. That's not the case. In fact, if you look at the incidence of morbid obesity, 
and at the penetration of bariatric surgery within this population, it's less than 1%, Carl. Less than 1% of people who are eligible for this treatment are getting it, right? There are many reasons for that. And one of them is obviously clearly, you know, not knowing and not understanding. Instead of diffusing their knowledge like you and I are doing through this program and encouraging people to research it, to look into it rather than suffer for years through morbid obesity and maybe even die early because of morbid obesity. Instead of encouraging them, we are putting obstacles and this has to stop. You know, bariatric surgery has to be recognized as an important form of treatment like cancer treatment, like other treatments for which we have no qualms when we encourage people to go to their doctor to get the treatment they need. So, um, you know, the, well, well, there's one picture that I, um, one image that I have, we probably need to make our own. Um, but let me just share this one because this is kind of like the, the you know, the, I mean, you know me well enough now that when I don't process it, when it doesn't go through my common sense uh, filter, then it becomes a huge issue and we start fighting. So this is kind of like the picture that I'm talking about, like the, the, uh, the obesity is in the center of all these types of issues. Um, hypertension, stroke, cancer, insulin resistance, diabetes, um, uh, vascular disease, like all these uh, are coming from obesity. It's not like because you have diabetes, now you are uh, morbidly obese. And this system needs to kind of change from that point. Now, Dr. Gal, um, I'm gonna actually uh, prep something for us for this specific uh, issue. And then um, there was one other patient that we wanted to actually it just happened today that I do want to actually take you to the insurance uh, commissioner because the, these policies are really punitive. So their approach is punitive. So, well, it's not uh, bad enough that you have morbid obesity. You have to really uh, fight for it, which shouldn't be the case. Now, uh, but let's talk about uh, uh, the issues, complications that we may have. And then we do want to kind of look at uh, intraoperative issues, uh, immediate postoperative issues, and short-term short -term and long-term. So if you can kind of uh, elaborate these for us and what uh, the patient should know, what they may go through, and then they can prep uh, better for those, uh, those times. Absolutely, absolutely. So essentially, the first thing that we have to say is that bariatric surgery in the modern form in which we practice it now, in places that are very well recognized for their quality outcome, like our surgery center, which is recognized by the MBSA QIP as a center of excellence for bariatric surgery, serious complications are very rare, right? But it is surgery and complications can happen. And obviously in our discussions with patients, this is an important area uh, for us to discuss when we do the consultation. So what, what could happen? Well, potentially there could be anesthesia problems, whether it's a problem with the breathing tube or, or problem with the IV access or medication reactions, anesthesia problems can occur like any surgery. Anesthesia, however, has never been as safe as it is right now, right? It is really at its highest and safest level uh, that it's ever been. Uh, specific about bariatric surgery, when, what can happen? Well, bleeding can occur. We are working with the organs that are well supplied with uh, vascularity. So Bleeding can happen during surgery. Is this common? Not common at all. Can it happen? Yes, it can happen. Are we able to take care of it if it happens? Absolutely. Our training actually allows us to take care of problems that can occur, particularly because we work near organs like the spleen that are very highly vascularized. Bleeding can occur from that point of view as well. Again, Kamal, how common is this? This is very, very rare. There are things that we take proactively to prevent all these issues, and that's why they these problems are very rare, but obviously they can happen. Can injury to an organ happen during surgery? Absolutely. This, this can happen. Is it common? Not at all. It's very, very rare, but it is something that can happen. And if it's happened, if it happens, we obviously can take care of it. Why can the surgery not be completed sometimes? Well, the surgeon could run into some problems very rarely that the cooperation could not be completed. One of the ones that is mentioned on this list is fatty liver, for instance. If the liver is so large and so pervasive throughout the abdomen that it's covering 
the whole of the stomach, it may be difficult to push it away safely and perform the operation. That is why we ask our patients actually, Kamala, as you know, to go through this pre-operative diet, which is a meal replacement diet. We call it new direction diet or robot diet that specifically help us actually to shrink the liver. The liver tends to be very large when we are overweight and the higher the, uh, the, the concentration of the weight around the waist of the person, the higher the chance that that person will have a very uh, large and uh, uh, very uh, very uh, dense liver that is very difficult to walk around. This is more, even more common, I would say, in men than it is in women, just because of the fat distribution. Uh, and so sometimes we end up recommending that the person does not only two weeks of the diet preparation, but three weeks in order to be able to uh, uh, overcome this issue. So we can, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, the change in mind, smoking, COVID, those um, are not, um, like COVID is new, uh, but what's our, uh, if we can just remind our uh, patients what our policies for COVID positives these absolutely, days? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, it's very important that we make sure that everybody that, you know, is coming for a surgery, that they have been screened, uh, 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 optimally that they are vaccinated, but even if they're not vaccinated, the surgery can still go ahead, but they have to have a negative test and then they have to uh, uh, isolate themselves before surgery, you know, after their, their test to make sure that they don't expose themselves. Uh, not only, it's not uh, obviously a good idea to do an elective operation on somebody who is positive for COVID, but also bringing somebody positive with COVID to the center obviously will expose other patients and other healthcare workers. So we take this issue extremely seriously. And so far we've been very successful in uh, preventing anybody with positive tests from having an operation. And uh, some of the uh, immediate issues can be in the post-op, uh, in the recovery area, right? So, um, if we can just go over those as well. Absolutely, happen. absolutely. So yes, there are a number of things that can happen in the recovery area. One of them obviously is uh, nausea and vomiting can happen. Too much discomfort or pain can happen. Low oxygen level can happen either because the lungs are not opening uh, properly or because of other problems. And bleeding can still happen uh, as well. Now, as you know, the immediate post-operative time is the time of intense monitoring of the patient. Uh, first of all, it's important because we recognize that these things can happen. We take preventative measures to minimize these things. For instance, in our center, we have a fairly refined protocol that actually minimizes nausea and vomiting in, in the immediate post-operative period. Uh, it is very rare for us to see a patient having severe nausea or vomiting right after surgery since we've instituted this protocol in our surgery center. This protocol actually involves giving medication even before surgery to try to blunt pain response and also to try to blunt the potential for nausea or vomiting. These are very strong medications that uh, we're able to give at the center before the surgery that minimize those problems. And then, as I said, there is an intense monitoring. Many of our patients uh, may have sleep apnea, for instance, so their ability to exchange air as they are still sleepy may be low, so the nurses have different things that they can do to, to make sure that their oxygenation is improved. For instance, we do have a CPAP machine in the center, in the recovery area that we apply to most of our patients, and that helps greatly. If bleeding happens, it's very rare, but if it happens, it tends to happen very early after surgery, whilst the patient is being very closely and uh, highly monitored. Uh, again, it's very rare. We do many things inside the surgery time to minimize bleeding, but we know bleeding can happen, particularly because all our patients are actually given a blood thinning medication before surgery to prevent blood clots, so it exposes them to this risk. But because we know that, we do many things to really minimize this. So bleeding is very rare, but it can happen. If it happens, it's recognized early and we can take care of it. Uh, promptly uh, if it does happen. And uh, most of our patients, they have their EGDs done in our center as well. So that gives our center to get to know the patient um, early on, uh, other than the, the surgeons, uh, anesthesia team and the um, our nurses, actually, they also know Absolutely. these patients. Um, now, Absolutely. for the first 30 days, Dr. Gale, what are the most... Um, 
common complications? Sure. So let's talk about the ones that are potentially life-threatening or serious complications. So the number three, you have leakage, for instance, right? And then number five, you have blood clots. Those are probably the more serious complications. Fortunately, in our program, these are extremely rare. And more importantly, in our program, we take care of these problems in the best way there is, and that is by preventing them in the first place. And prevention is by far the best way to take care of complications, right? And we have excellent tools for doing that. For instance, as far as leakage is concerned, leakage means really when the wound on the stomach or on the intestine, depending on the type of surgery that we've done, doesn't heal very well and substances escape, that can cause an infection. That's what leakage is. But we do many things really to minimize that including using a special buttressing material when we are sealing the stomach or the intestine that really minimizes that. In addition, our dissection and our uh, uh, work around the tissues is done in such a gentle manner to preserve as much as possible the vascularity of that organ so that organ heals very well. So leakage can happen, but it's extremely rare in our program, but it's one of the potentially serious complications of bariatric surgery. The other potentially serious complication is, as I said, is number five, and that's blood clot formation. Now, blood clots can occur with any surgery, but they can occur with a higher uh, uh, frequency when patients are morbidly obese. So if you look at the risk factors for blood clots after surgery, one of them is morbid obesity. So by definition, our patients have a high rate for these potential complications. Because we know that, Kamal, we actually take many preventative measures to minimize this. And our patients actually, although they have supposed to have a high frequency of this uh, complication, they end up having a frequency which is even lower than thin patients having other surgeries. And what are these preventative measures that we take? Well, first of all, we give every patient a blood thinning medication. Now, surgeons used to be afraid of giving blood thinning medication in the past because it can increase bleeding. But yeah. because we are doing the surgery laparoscopically with such precision, bleeding is not as much of a problem as it used to be from, for our predecessors. So we give, we give blood thinning medication. What's the other thing that we do that is very effective in minimizing blood clots? We get the patient up and walking early. Now, to get the patient to walk early, you have to be able to control their pain. You have to be able to do things that they don't have nausea or dizziness. And we have many things that we do to enhance that as well. As you recall, in our surgery center, you see patients walking within an hour, within two hours after surgery. So early ambulation or early walking is by far one of the most effective ways for preventing blood clots. Well, the third why, thing- I'm, I'm sorry, that's why the, um, having the nurses who are specialized in bariatric, uh, so that our nurses, they only, um, well, every day they do bariatric. It's not like they only do bariatric, but every day they're assigned to a bariatric case. So, in the bigger institutions, uh, it may not be the same nursing team going through these patients. So the specialists uh, being expert, uh, having the right expertise, uh, not just from the surgical side, but from the nursing side is life-saving uh, from that point. Uh, and that's, uh, we are actually doing a really good job on that. Absolutely. So by far the best way to really take care of this complication is to prevent it. Again, to focus on prevention. And we've done really... Uh, very, very well minimizing this complication. The third preventative method that we use for blood clots is, is to put a special, um, uh, special compression boots around the legs of the patient when they are asleep during surgery. So there is a constant um, uh, uh, stimulation of the uh, blood vessels on the legs so that flow is encouraged as opposed to the blood uh, uh, staying still, which uh, you know, can cause blood clots. So blood clots is uh, you know, one of the more serious, but as I said, if you use excellent preventative methods, you can minimize this uh, problem considerably. Now blood clots can occur in the legs, can occur in the lungs, and can occur also in the abdomen, all uh, important things. And then of course, you know, this can happen up to 30 days after surgery. That's why we tell our patients when they go home to walk, 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 walk. That is a very important 
uh, thing that we tell them. And of course, to let us know if there is anything that could uh, suggest uh, the occurring of a blood clot, whether it's pain in their cuffs on their legs when they are walking. And of course, chest pain, shortness of breath, these are extremely important signs that they want us to alert us on if uh, they were to occur. So now that takes us to our long-term complications. So um, this is the final part for this topic. So um, over the six months, uh, what type of complications you may be expecting? Sure. So depending on the type of surgery, and if we were to take the two more common surgeries that we do, gastric sleeve and the gastric bypass, uh, with gastric sleeve, probably the more common complication that we see is heartburn or gastroesophageal reflux. That can happen after the a gastric sleeve, uh, not on everybody, but it can happen sometimes in people who used to have heartburn and sometimes even in people who don't have heartburn, it can occur uh, as a new uh, issue requiring medication. The important thing at this stage is obviously to recognize it and offer medication. And also we do, uh, uh, you know, freely do uh, endoscopy afterwards to make sure that there is no uh, severe damage to the food pipe because of the reflux. Of course, there are things the patient can do to minimize the occurrence of reflux, uh, particularly if it is something that is occurring occasionally. We can talk about uh, types of food that uh, may be better for them. We can talk about timing of their meals, particularly dinner, and of course, uh, having a good support on their head when they are lying in bed at night. These are very important things that uh, uh, they can undertake. Heartburn or reflux is rare with uh, gastric bypass, but it can occur after gastric bypass as well. Uh, hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, this is something that can happen particularly after gastric bypass, and very often it's taken care of by manipulating the diet that the person is uh, taking. Malnutrition can happen particularly after gastric bypass because of the rerouting of the intestine and because we are going bypassing that early portion of the intestine that is very active in absorbing nutrients, a person who's had gastric bypass could be exposed to malnutrition, particularly when it comes to micronutrients like minerals and vitamins, but also to uh, protein. So it is important that they are taking the supplements, but it's also important that they follow on a regular basis with us for the rest of their life. So we can do blood work uh, from time to time to make sure they're not uh, running short of any of those uh, nutrients. Uh, gallstones can occur after uh, weight loss surgery. We know that rapid weight loss can increase the chances of gallstone formation. Again, this is best taken care of with preventative measures. In fact, all our patients who still have their gallbladder, they are prescribed a special medication that decreases the incidence of gall gallstones. It's called orsodial, and they have to take this medication once a day for six months. And uh, studies have shown that if patients take this medication, the incidence of gallbladder problems after bariatric surgery can be decreased from about 30% to 3%, so considerable decrease in that incidence. The other one that you've mentioned is hernia. Hernias can occur, can occur after any abdominal surgery because when we do surgery, we are weakening the muscle of the abdomen. But thankfully, the way we do surgery right now is laparoscopically, so the incisions are small, so the weakening of the muscles is small. So hernias are not very common, but they can occur. There is a special type of hernia that can occur after gastric bypass. It's called internal hernia. And that can occur because sometimes after weight loss, certain pockets can form uh, where the intestine can be tied in and cause bowel blockage. So anybody who's had gastric bypass, if they experience severe abdominal pain, they need to seek treatment by uh, calling their surgeon or go to the uh, near, nearest uh, emergency room. This is an important uh, factor. Uh, we talk about stricture. What is stricture? Stricture essentially means that there is tightening of an opening. It can happen after gastric bypass, for instance, if the connection between the new stomach and the intestine becomes too mm -hmm. tight. It can happen because of scar tissue. And we take care of that actually by uh, stretching that opening without repeating the surgery just with the endoscope. It can happen after the sleeve as well, but less commonly. Now, dumping is something that patients talk about a lot. Dumping is really a series of symptoms, including abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or even fainting that can occur, particularly after a procedure like gastric bypass, if that patient were to eat some refined sugars. So the, the patient will tell you, I had that piece of chocolate and I immediately knew it. You know, they 
feel like fainting, they feel dizzy, they have abdominal cramps. That is really dumping because of consumption of high refined sugars after gastric bypass. So gastric bypass patients are instructed really to avoid refined sugars for that reason. And patients may not listen and still do it, but once the, it has happened once, then they are not gonna repeat it uh, because it's such an unpleasant uh, uh, symptom. It, it tends to happen much, much less. Uh, Frequently after and some of the some of these complications, as you are, um, you know, although we, I, I mean, I spend um, uh, a lot of hours every day uh, with the program. Uh, as you are explaining, and you know, I always say that when we listen um, to the clinician, and if we pay attention, we always learn something new, uh, or we actually better understand. So, but what what uh, helps me to know is that our patient uh, selection process and the program itself are checkpoints and how we are preparing our patients. Uh, this is, uh, you and I, we have seen so many different programs and we haven't seen anything like what we have mm -hmm. in the entire uh, country. So uh, we do hear some bad um, experiences from different parts of the uh, world. Actually, in fact, right now there's a case going on with, uh, do you remember that, um, uh, singer last year we talked about her yeah. so yeah. she's up again uh, it's almost like her one year anniversary so she made a bad, bad selection and mm -hmm. they are blaming the doctors And then, but the thing is uh, this is why we have this program in place so mm -hmm. the patient needs to understand what they're going through this is not about becoming uh, uh, from a model to supermodel this is about being healthy yeah. uh, it's about it's a life saving procedure uh, yes. And some people really don't, still don't understand why uh, this is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but many out bad outcomes are coming from those uh, programs who don't have what we have in place. So the patient selection process needs to be uh, extremely tight and patient needs to be prepped for what's coming. And they can actually deal with these, uh, these issues in a better way. The checkpoints needs to be in place. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why we have a program. We don't have just surgery, we have a program, which means that we have to be able to uh, make sure that patients are appropriate for the surgery, and we have to make sure that we prepare them in the most optimal way mm -hmm. so that that minimizes complications. And a good, high-quality program will have lower rates of these complications because of the prevention, yeah. because of the attention that is uh, placed on prevention. And prevention is always by far better than taking care of the problem when it occurs. Absolutely. Um, uh, in our uh, next sessions, I do want to actually go into the uh, uh, qualification issues again. Sure. And sure. Uh, also sure. Uh, kind of educating the public about uh, the root um, uh, cause uh, analysis of the uh, morbid obesity and Absolutely. make you understand that this is not a uh, complication of diabetes. Well, diabetes is the complication of, of morbid obesity. So, uh, and then if we have these uh, uh, conditions, and if you don't have obesity, fine. But if you have obesity, the others are. If they don't, if you don't have it today, you'll have it um, in the next twelve months or twenty-four months. So that's something that. Uh, we need to spend more time to educate our people. Uh, and, uh, and also, like, uh, because we finish our um, uh, different topics, uh, this is the second time I believe we finished the whole thing. Uh, we will have one more session this year for the remaining time uh, about the uh, intermittent diet. So we'll just revisit that. So in the next couple of weeks, we'll discuss those. Uh, do you have anything to add before we close? No, no. What I would like to say, Kamal, is that um, bariatric surgery still is the most effective treatment we have, but it's a serious treatment as well. Uh, it cannot be taken lightly. Yes, it's surgery. Yes, complications can happen. But at the end of the day, in our head, we have to be able to justify the benefits of the surgery uh, versus the risks. And that's key, right? Is it better for a person to remain with obesity and struggle day after day with lots of medications with the potential of shortening their life because of their illnesses? Or is it better for them to have uh, surgery? Clearly the risks of the surgery are so much lower 
happen right now because bariatric surgery is so much safer. So that is the kind of conversation we need to have with our patients. It's not really uh, uh, saying there's no complication. Of course, complications can happen, but what are those risks, first of all, by when you come to a program mm -hmm. like ours? And what do those risks compare? How do those risks compare with the risks of staying morbidly obese? And that's an important conversation that we as uh, professionals have to have with our patients. You know, uh, just um, just because you mentioned that, so uh, when we are going through the ACO uh, case conferences, now we do list number of medications patients take for uh, certain chronic illnesses groups, and the hypertension is usually two to three, and the diabetes is about two to three. So between the two chronic illnesses, they already have either like four to six different medications, yeah. and that's that's complicated. So just for everyone to manage that and then keep doing it for their entire life. Uh, is complicated. So, um, but we'll, we'll give more examples in our next sessions. And again, uh, thank you for joining us very now. And thank we'll you, see you next week. Thank you so much yeah. again. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.